Welcome to the Peoria River Museum's Art Club, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Holly Johnson. I'm the Every Student Initiative Coordinator at the Peoria River Museum, and I'm so excited to be hosting our local artist, Natalia villanueva Linares for today's Art Club presentation. This Zoom presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the museum's YouTube account following the presentation. So if you do not want your image or video visible, feel free to stop your video from view. Everyone is muted to begin with, and please keep your video muted unless you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. We invite questions and comments at the end of uh, Natalia's presentation. Um, so at the end of the presentation, you can unmute to ask your questions. However, if you do not want to talk, uh, feel free to ask a question in the comment section, and I will ask the question for you. Uh, if you don't think you can remember your question as you're waiting for the end of the presentation, go ahead and drop it in the comments and I will ask it at the end for you anyway. Without uh, further to do, a big welcome to Natalia Villanueva Linares. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am very excited to be able to participate and present my work uh, at the Riverfront Museum with the Art Club. Um, it's very important to me. Uh, you asked me just before we started uh, if I was uh, excited or nervous or prepared and all of it. Actually, I'm answering all the everything at the same time. Nervous is not the word, but I would say that it's pretty beautiful uh, to be able to present what has been happening in the past 10 years and how a lot of my art making uh, purely has been the nest of most of the artworks I'm going to present here, uh, if not because the materials were found here or the artwork, artworks were made here or presented here in Peoria. Um, and I'm going to share my screen to show you a little more. I'm sorry, I am unable to, it's not popping out. There it is, thank you. Up. Okay, let me see. Holly, could you please tell me if you can see well my screen right now? Yep, uh, we can see and you've just entered presentation mode. Perfect. Um, so as um, Holly said very well, my name is Natalia Villanueva Linares. I am a French Peruvian artist, um, this is me. <laughs> I, I am very intentional always to mention that I am both. French and Peruvian because I grew up in both countries. Uh, I grew up in both countries the same amount of years um, in the city of Lima, which is the capital of Peru, and the city of mostly in the city of Paris, which is, as you all know, the, the capital of, of France, where I was making, I, I've, I was doing my, um, my studies in art. Please excuse me. Wow. Okay. That was very, I'm so sorry. Um, I was doing my studies um, in art at the time when I met um, Earl Power Murphy. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because everything stopped apparently as I'm opening again. Um, so when I was doing my studies, um, just a moment, I'm going to, I had a mistake on my, a spam called me. I'm so sorry. A spam broke everything. Excellent. Please excuse me. Um, here. I'm doing this again. You. you. Okay, great. I'm so sorry. And I'm starting again. And I'm going to turn off my phone. <laughs> so spams don't bug, bug me anymore. Um, so here, um, there is something that is very important is that when I met Earl Power Murphy in Paris, um, I didn't know uh, that when he told me that he was from a city named Peoria, I thought that um, he meant Pura, which is the name of a city in Peru, and I thought he was Peruvian. And he said, no, 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 Peoria, and told me that it was a city that was next to Chicago. So that kind of located me, but I had no idea what was coming later. So um, I'm going to make a presentation um, about the organization that Earl and I created, which the name is Yaku, then also about the magazine uh, that I founded, named Ukaizin, it's an international arts magazine. 
and about my art making um, in the past, the selection of artworks from the past 10 years. Um, if you don't know me, um, I would like to tell you that this is the reason why I moved to Peoria. Earl uh, asked me to purchase the Hale Memorial Church um, when I was finishing my studies. And I would like to let him tell you in his own words through a, an extract of a video um, that I that was made by a French filmmaker named Coralie Morin. She came to Peoria to make this film to help us uh, found, find money to be able to uh, restore the doors and the floors of the building. Um, this beautiful film was edited by Tori Dahlhoff. Um, he's a journalist and film producer here in Peoria. And you will be able to see the inside of the church, which is pretty beautiful. So this is the reason why we started our organization with Earl. Oh, it's... Can you hear the sound of the video? Well, this is quite unusual, but uh, let me tell you, Earl was telling that the inside of this beautiful place was magnificent and you can get to see the pretty phenomenal uh, structure inside, the beautiful balconies, the windows, not many people got to be inside of the building um, because it has been in a very rough shape. And uh, what he mentions also was that it was impossible for us to not pursue this project. It was, um, it was really looking for us to be able to create something with it. And we wanted to make uh, an international cultural center inside to invite artists and people who might be interested in discovering our city um, to come and exhibit their works there for us to be able to, um, to discover other cultures through visual arts. So this is a group of, 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 of people working inside of the building, cleaning, arranging, organizing. Um, this is inside of the balcony. It has three floors. Um, so I, I was um, very excited for you to be able to see this video. You can see all of it and listen to this beautiful uh, film in, um, in our website. I'll tell you more in a moment. So Yaku, uh, that's the reason why Yaku was born because the whole building inside, but outside, but also the insides were full of beauty and we were eager for Peoria to rediscover uh, its beauty and we wanted to repurpose it. So today I'm going to focus mostly on the art part of our arts parts of our organization. I want to talk to you about what were our, what have been our efforts um, as an arts organization. Um, it's an overview. We have done so many things in the past 10 years. So this is an overview of the most um, remarkable uh, things we've done together. One of them is our snacks, which are our small nomadic art experiences. And the other one is Ukaizin, which is our international magazine, as I mentioned before. Ukai um, is Yaku backwards. The word Yaku uh, in Quechua is the language of that the Incas used to speak. It's so still a language that is spoken in the Andes in South America. Um, means water. So Yaku or water was the person participating. It wasn't the name of the church. It was the name of, it was, it was the, the, the person who participates and make this project vital. The person who makes uh, this project grow, so sorry. Um, so you are the water who makes things happen. So I'm gonna start uh, showing two of the most Re remarkable um, artworks that our organization has done. Uh, the, this one was the most memorable one, if you're not familiar with it. This is our Love Spring installation. It was created by the whole organization. I had very little to do with this project. I mean, I participated, but it wasn't my, it was, it was Christine Chisamore in, in, with uh, John Seckler, our art director, John Seckler, Christine Chisamore, our uh, co-chair with her husband, Randy Ross, they created this uh, incredible project. And uh, with the generosity of businesses around Peoria, we were able to ask if we could leave paper hearts in each one of these businesses for them to, um, for people to be able to write, what do you love and what do you hope? What do you love from, from, from Peoria? And what do you hope for Peoria? At the time, we didn't feel there was such a, an awakening feeling, vibrancy as we have now. And so many people excited to create new things and so much um, in some way um, 
social media presence. So it was a way for us to awaken the feel of, of potential of, of our city and all this love, they made it, we all made it pour out of each one of the doors. So it was an overwhelming amount of love that was coming out made by Peorians, right? Written by Peorians. It could also, it, it lasted three days and people could come and write also on the hearts. It was um, a pretty, uh, pretty incredible experience. And I know that um, I have seen after these efforts that all these campaign, we made a whole love campaign. I know that, and it, it feels pretty beautiful to feel that it has inspired other artists and other organizations after, and we're very proud of that. What a lot of people don't know is that a few months prior to that, we worked really hard uh, to cover all the windows with colors. So it wasn't as covered by the press as um, our Love Spring installation, but during a few months prior, in a very cold, very, very cold and windy day, we spent hours all together, so beautiful. Um, a, a, it was a very powerful sense of achievement to feel that we all were able to build this covering all the windows on the on the main main street side and high street side of the church and we were just it was part of our campaign kind of like to revive the building to remind to remind Peoria that of its existence and our intentions with it we our snacks the small artistic experiences started by um, knocking on doors of um, empty storefronts of business owners who had empty storefronts and we made performances and installations. I remember this one was on Main Street. It's across the street from what used to be Mr. G's. I think it's Harold's right now. I am not completely sure. Um, I haven't been there in a long time. So this empty, this building was empty and we asked the owner if we could do a show for one night. So it happened several times. We had several shows where we did one uh, experience for one night. People would stop not knowing we were having the show. They stopped their cars. It was so cold and they would it was pretty beautiful to see that people would take the time uh, to come and just stand outside and see what was happening inside. This, was, this uh, performance was also um, a beautiful, it was two hour long performance uh, with nine participants and it was inside of Pekin Express. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the yellow restaurant on Main Street right next to the church. So this was all the dining area and the public was able to see from uh, as soon as they came in, they were able to see all this. Um, then there was, um, I, okay. <laughs> so the persons who were in charge of our, of our arts team, there were, there were two managers, Bethany Coffin and Christine Chisamore, both artists. Um, and they both thought that this process of renting, of asking for, for businesses to lend us their spaces or even house owners who lent us their own homes uh, was a bit too long for us to prepare, to paint, to clean, to propose to artists. So they decided to simplify everything. And they told, they, they proposed to us that we would, um, we should rent containers and make art shows inside of shipping containers. So our last snacks happened inside of shipping containers. And um, as I mentioned prior, we have an art director who has done a sublime work at uh, making incredible flyers. These were the last three shows that we made, the snacks four, five, and six. Also, uh, the artist and designer Maria Lavender has helped us. She's also a native from Peoria, as John is. So uh, this is what they feel when you walk around. We've done them at the same time as First Fridays because we park our uh, container not far away from the Sunbeam building, Ribbon Records, all this area that is in movement. So um, you can walk, the doors are open, everyone's welcome and it stays only for a few hours. So this is um, the feel that you have when you go. Um, many people come, go, stay. It really feels like a beautiful um, gallery, a real, real gallery. They've done, they, they create, a, they create a, a pretty beautiful structure inside. Even at night, it looks like a beautiful professional gallery. I was very impressed with this work because I realized when they created this and everyone, the whole team was um, made this happen, I felt as if, oh, now Yaku is its own. Yaku is not a project that Natalia and Earl co-founded. This belongs to its own city from people who are advocates and ambassadors for the arts and they're making it happen. And it was pretty beautiful. Sorry, I don't know what is the 
it's not helping. Okay. <laughs> so Ukaizin uh, came because these snacks happen mostly on beautiful days. It's a container made of metal. If it rains, if there is thunder, we don't we don't want to put people in danger. So um, because of um, the 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 season in some way of uh, the, the seasoning part of um, of our job as in our snacks events. Uh, I was looking to do something a bit faster because I felt that artists that are, that I, I have been talking about Peoria in every trip I've made with many artists. So when I have artists who are knocking our door, so what's going on in Peoria? When is this happening? When can I come? It was very, it was pretty beautiful. So we needed to react to it faster. So I decided to create a whole team with the help of Angela Baldus, who also was uh, an artist, who was also the the arts manager of our team for, for a period of time, we created a team of people who would be able to create uh, this magazine. So our first volume is volume zero. We call it zero so uh, it can be the beginning, right? We don't know what's gonna happen, we're gonna try, let's see, our, our, through a designing part, just we, we were adjusting, uh, we were going to adjust with the first one. So we, we, did, we did our best and it was pretty fantastic. So. What the magazine has uh, that is very unique is that it presents, it's, a, it's an encounter, an encounter between the ones who want to come and the ones who are curious to discover what wants to come to their city. So um, on one part, we have articles about Peoria. We always put an article about the church um, and then about different places or different uh, events that happen in our city. And another part is about artists, artists who are curious of our city too. So for them to discover what's going on in Peoria and for us to discover them, that was the, the, the goal of this magazine. We did, uh, we launched this magazine. Uh, John and, um, and Angie Walker let us use the Sunbeam building. We made an incredible uh, release of the magazine and we completely sold out that night. Everyone came, the people who were part of this team were able to talk about their experience, thank everyone for, for, the, for, for participating and helping us, and, and it was pretty beautiful. And then volume one arrived. And that was pretty incredible. I'm gonna tear up. Um, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> Um, it's a masterpiece made by Peorians and they've done an incredible job. Um, it was uh, the photo, it, it's incredible. I have it in my hand, I don't know if you can see me, but it's a tiny little pearlescent treasure made in Peoria. It's just so gorgeous. When you look inside, the design work, uh, the articles, the, um, the photographic work is exquisite. Um, so we have, of course, articles about Peoria. Um, you can see Peoria, beautiful photographic works. We also have photographies of our, our snacks events. And um, of course, we have also the work of artists who are located or in different cities of the US or in different countries who are still very eager to come by and share their work, hopefully. Now, Ukaizin is online. Uh, we have it, you, you can find it online. It's ukaizin.com or .org. You can find it with both. And if you pay attention on the top right of your screen or on your phone or on your computer, you will see that there is uh, an indication for you to be able to read the articles on three different languages. Um, oh. And this uh, is everything. Um, the list of people that you see here are, um, uh, again, I'm focusing only on the arts team, people who have been working, contributing, makers, contributors, uh, Yaku arts team, uh, Ukaizin, digital and on paper. These are all the people who through the years have been contributing and making everything happen. Uh, without them, we would have never been able to uh, accomplish, you know, have impactful, this, make these impactful events. And without them, the quality of our work would have never reached so much uh, beauty. So um, they've, they've worked really hard. Uh, we had many meetings um, for years, weekly after work. They have uh, 
they they came for hours of they have volunteered hours of endless work and it's pretty fantastic to know that um peoria has so much potential and so many people who are eager to see it grow and i'm very thankful for the community that we created um, the reason why I, this is not the whole group, there is so many more people who participated, um, but there is something that is important about this photograph is that the building does not belong to Yaku anymore. So we, after making a feasibility study that was very costly in, in itself, um, we, um, we learned that it would be too costly for our organization to take care of the building. Um, so we have shifted to our project now has shifted. So the building, we do not know who's the new owner. If you have any questions about the new owner or its future, we are unaware of what is going to happen. We, um, that it, it belongs to someone else and it doesn't belong to us. We have so much to, to, to make and we can't, um, we can't do everything at the same time. Um, voila, so I'm going to show you um, what, we are going to be focusing on now. <laughs> so this is High Place. Uh, it's a mini mansion across the street from the giant oak tree. It is a home that was purchased by Earl and by me to be able to rent the space uh, to many people, but also to be able to, in the future, over time, to create residency programs um, for artists who want to come to Peoria and want to share their works here. Um, also, it's very important to know that we have participated already in, uh, in in certain events. We have um, we participated in Terrain Biennial, uh, this national actually it's an international uh, it's an international event uh, with outdoors artworks, and I participated presenting two. I I was a curator of these two artists, who are Martin Monchicourt, he is the the pink colored flag and the artist Jesse Meredith, who presented this beautiful artwork outside. If you want to learn more about the artworks, you can find that all the information in detail on our website. Um, so what we want to accomplish in over time also with High Place is, after all the work that we have been putting um, to our projects, is what we want is to be able to support other organization and other alternative art spaces who are located in different places, other cities, bigger cities, to propose them to send here exhibitions that they have presented already, make a selection of the most beautiful show they've done and bring it here to Peoria. So we can find a way to help decentralize art that you can only find in urban settings that you need to travel three hours to see, you won't need to anymore because some artworks, some exhibitions will come to your door. So that's uh, your city. <laughs> so that's what we want is to support a system that creates a decentralization of the arts from the urban settings and hopefully help create a, a polonize arts through all throughout the country. So we uh, that beautiful show we did outside was on the first on the on the on the cover of the arts section uh, of the P, our PJ star. Inside of the house, we've done many in multiple installations and. Um, the last event that we did was outside. This is a collective, um, it's a, sorry, two artists named Heaven World um, with Nathaniel Lucas and, and Skyler Edwards. They made a show outdoors. So that's something that we will be th thinking about making more in the future to create events where people can be far away from each other and uh, always respecting a very small amount of people. So there is space in between everyone. So this was, the reason that pretty much what I have been working on the past 10 years with the arts team, and this is very, a very small amount of all the work that we did together. Um, it's a very big team that has been changing over the years, not too much. Um, but these creative minded people have uh, changed my life and I know that they have changed also the culture of Peoria. I am convinced they have changed the culture of Peoria. They, they brought something to it that is uh, remarkable. And you can find us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, if you want to see, please follow us because there is more to come in the future. Maybe not tomorrow, but there is more to come in the future, um, in the nearish future. In the particular situation we're all living, we don't know what can happen, but we'll, we'll do our best as we have done 
up until now. So now I would like to tell you a bit about my um, art making. These works, as I said before, were related to what I have been doing, a selection of works that I've done, uh, that I've made in Peoria. Um, and I'm going to start, let me see what works here. Perfect. With installations, uh, objects and treasures. So I, uh, I have to, as I, as I come from Peru and also from France in time, a very good friend of mine told me that he, he realized how I had two very distinct approaches to my work. And he was very surprised to see it. And thanks to his, his, uh, these words, I was able to read a bit more into my work and realize that there was really two different, two different forms of life in my work. One could be monumental artworks with a very strong feel with, for, for volume, but others can be very, very small objects that can be very charged uh, with a lot of effort or a very, very strong metaphorical spirit, let's say. So um, I'm a person who was a, like an animist, a person who sees in objects. I, I, am, I have a magnetic attraction to objects. We can ask that to my husband. <laughs> um, when I feel that objects are charged with uh, life, story, history, um, I feel as if um, we could work together, tell a story together, work together. So I, um, I'm going to present to you a selection of a few works that are part of a series, two works that are part of a series named The High-Pitched Sisters of the Great Colorial. So this is a, it's a group of sisters, artworks who are sisters of a, bi of a bigger one. And it starts with this one. My mother, this is an exhibition uh, in Paris. Um, so the title of this, of this collection of works um, was for this art show. And my, and it started because my mom came to Peoria to visit with my father. They both came together and I was eager to take her to the church mouse. I was still am in love with the church mouse, not only because it was very cheap, but also because I was able to find treasures, things that I had never seen before or that were very typical and, and very US like, but of course, as a person who was very new to the city, I had never seen certain things. My mother is a knitter and a seamstress. Actually, she's an incredible meter and incredible seamstress. So when I was with her, which was pretty incredible, I discovered these thread spools. I had never seen wooden thread spools in my life. I thought I had seen a metal in plastic, you know, the long plastic ones, the cardboard ones. Uh, so I had seen many, but I had never seen those. She found that cute because she might have seen them in her life and told me, I'll give them to you. Of course, it wasn't more than $3.10, but it was a... Uh, it was a gift that changed my life. So um, not too long after, my parents went back to Peru and um, I had these 32 thread spools that were so beautiful. And I felt as if they had something, something to tell, you know? So I decided to, <laughs> I decided to tell their story and I put them in a box. I would take all of them together and cut half an inch. All of them together and cut half an inch. So I have a video, a film of this process, uh, which will be presented in this gallery in December of this year again. The name is Breathing of this film because you can feel all the spools giving as I'm cutting and then stopping for a moment. And again, giving because I'm pulling and it's, it's pretty beautiful. So it took me a year and a half to make this work. And uh, there is a, a vintage connoisseur, a um, beautiful friend of mine named Jenny Foster who would come with me. I really needed to finish this artwork to, uh, to be able to present it. And I, I, I really needed help. So I had a friend, this, this friend would come every single Monday and work with me all day cutting. It took a year and a half to make this whole project. And the whole story was told. When you get close to it, you can see that every gesture is like a word. You can almost read their story. Every page has been laminated. And little by little, they disappear and they get smaller and smaller, as you can see at the end of the page. And this is what they look like when they're together. It's a book. It's a book of their story. So this sister is sister zero. I have others, zero to uh, one to three to so many. But this one, uh, the zero is the first one. And I call this one zero because the material gave absolutely everything. It gave it all, you know. So that's... Um, 
I'm going to show you the, the, the main piece, the main course. It was Colorio. Uh, this was taken, this is an incredible, an incredible art, an incredible photograph taken of my artwork by Skylar Edwards, uh, a very good friend of mine who takes incredible photographs of my work. And I trust his, my, my, my work to him uh, with my life. <laughs> his work is exceptional. So this beautiful installation, sorry, this beautiful photograph of my installation. So this is not the artwork. This is an incredible photograph of my artwork. Um, it has 300 thread spools. It's a project that I was looking to make inside of the church that I wanted to be massive, huge, all the thread spools in the world. I had friends who were, artists friends who were in residence in, in New York telling me, I have, I can see in the factory lots of thread spools. You want me to send them? They sent me thread spools from other cities, other countries. I had the material, but I wanted to start first with a small amount. So this, um, this little one, Colorio, is like a little empire, a little city made of colors. And each one of them is giving a, a piece, you know, a part of them. Um, it's a gesture that I was looking to make, but what was pretty incredible was that I discovered, not knowing this, because I had never seen wooden spools like, spools like that, is that they had this indenture on them to stop the thread, which I was like, whoa, we were meant to meet. <laughs> I can tell you that's how I reacted. I pretty, I'm pretty sure I cried when I discovered that. So to me, it's pretty incredible to see how what I want to accomplish is also given by the object. The object in some way, we were, yeah, it was an encounter. We were meant to meet and this was supposed to happen to them and to me. So this work, um, this is what it looks like. So they all meet in one point. Um, I, I, I see this, uh, this work as a mathematical formula, but sensible, a sensible mathematical formula because of time and space, the way it occupies time and space, its own time and the way it occupies space. And they all meet in one point, zero. And that's zero, origin. It's um, a cut of the 300 thread spools together. It's tiny, it's two, in, uh, two inches uh, by one and a half. It's very small, also laminated. Um, and it's like a seed. If you had one of those seeds, you could almost plant it to see if another one would grow. <laughs> so um, I made 200 of those uh, seeds, but that one was the most strong ones. And each one of them is very unique and they're all different because none of the cuts are identical, right? So there is a lot of, um, um, a lot of my work is related to uniqueness and I'll, you will, I'll tell you more in just a moment about that. When I came back to Peoria, I, was, I, I applied to have a residency at the Prairie Center of the Arts. And I had a, I think, six to eight months residency program. It was pretty incredible. I had, they gave me the second gallery of the gallery space they have as my studio at the beginning. So I pretty much took over the whole space. I was, it was like heaven, it was incredible. And I made two of my biggest artworks there at the time, not anymore, at the time, and, um, and performances. It was, it was incredible. So when I was uh, doing my residency program, I, I noticed working with different materials that paper bags, this work name is Devota, which in English translates as devoted. So um, it has the shape of a waka. You can feel that it's a temple, but wakas are the way that we call our temples in Peru that are meant, of course, to meet, you know, the celestial beings, uh, to, to make sacrifices to, you know, help the crops or have a good year. So um, a, a good year of um, food and, you know, um, farming at the time. So this is an ancient temple made with paper bags. And I, I noticed that paper bags had the same color, almost the same structure when I would look from far away to adobe bricks that these temples were made of. So I decided to make this temple with a material that can be ruined or damaged in the same way as adobe bricks, a brick, bricks can be hurt, damaged, wind, water, and time. And which seems unlikely because it's so delicate that they have so much in common. Um, and there's something that um, when you came into the room, this is what you saw. So you were unable to get close to the wakas. When I, when we moved, when I was, one of our returns to Peru was when I was nine years old, eight and a half, eight and three quarters. Um, and they had, um, it was an awakening of the protection of landmarks. 
So all they have discovered many wakas and they decided, oh, we have to close, we have to stop. People can't walk on them anymore because they're sacred, they're important. They're carrying our history. No one can get close to them. And we had just arrived, so we would, they would take us on these trips, you know, school trips, and every walk I would go to, we would be so far away from them. But they, they were meant for us to understand that they command respect. We have to be respectful from our, our history. We can't get close to it. We are to observe, you know, um, and protect it for all other generations to be able to see it, which was very frustrating for me because I could see on the adobe bricks from far away that other people had engraved their names on the bricks, put little hearts, you know, Nati and Nene. And I was like, well, I can see the foot of a person on that adobe brick. I can't go. So it was, it was a bit frustrating. It was a feel of a bit of frustration, but at the same time, it was an ocean of gestures. So it was taking over the space and, and it was something that is, that I don't think would have the same impact as it had here in Peoria, is that paper bags uh, is a culture, it, it, in the culture, in this culture, are related to nourishment. So it was pretty beautiful to see that this object that is meant to, this form that is meant to nourish people of belief and hope is made of an object that here in the US specifically, let's talk only about Peoria, is an object that is meant to nourish us, you know? I don't know if it would have the same impact in other countries. I feel that it's, it's a very uh, US Peruvian artwork. Um, and two years later, I was invited to do a show, participate in the alumni, and I decided to make an artwork that communicated with the Vota, but in time. It was two years later, but it was not necessarily its opposite, but it's contemporary, and a new contemporary form of architecture that happens in Peru. And a bit sadder though. Um, this artwork name is Estera, and it's made with um, wrapping paper, uh, cuts of wrapping paper. You know, when you try to, uh, make, to, make a, to wrap a gift, there is something that I find extremely frustrating. That is a cut, it's straight, it rolls again. I have a big problem with that. So I decided to use my, my fr this frustrating, ge frustrating gesture to distribute actually these paper rolls. So it, hundreds, I don't know if thousands, but hundreds of paper rolls. Uh, we were a very big team uh, making this project. I don't think I would have made it without my friends. Uh, they helped me make this happen. Um, and Estera is not the name of this small little home. Estera is the name of the material of the walls uh, the people who come from different parts of uh, Peru, the Andes, the rainforest, and they go to the big city to give opportunities to their families to, to go to university, to study for themselves or, their, or members of their families. Um, they move to the big city with nothing. So they, they create uh, small homes for themselves to begin, which are made at when, when I while I was in Peru, that was a very common practice. And Estera is just the name of that fabric. Usually the, the, the ceilings are made of metal, you know, to protect, but it's a very rudimentary way of living. No water, no, no running water, no electricity. It's, it's very wild. So um, something that I realized is that the whole city of Lima is surrounded by these little homes. And that inside of them, we have people who speak different languages from all our ancestors. They know different beliefs, cost, uh, customs, uh, foods. They're carrying the history, they're the, the representative of the lineage of our history. So all these little homes are packed with our history. And what I wanted was to celebrate them and make this estera in some way take over the room with its beauty, you know? So it takes over the room with its beauty. It's a very intense beauty, but yes, and very delicate because it's made of paper. And this, two weeks later, I think, after we finished that installation, we needed to work on this one because I had the immense pleasure to exhibit at uh, the Rear Front Museum. I uh, was honored to be one, I think we were 46 artists at the time of Emerge, an incredible exhibition. Um, uh, before participating, I asked, I asked, how much space do I have? <laughs> and I was told I had, you know, uh, eight feet by, um, I don't remember, but I remember having eight feet long. I was like, oh, okay, can I go to the top of the ceiling? Why not? Okay, so I did. 
and I went to the ceiling. So this was, I tried to in some way make an installation with the amount of space they were giving me. Mina is the name of this work. And I'm gonna go back to the previous photograph. Uh, Mina is made, this is dirt that comes from the surrounding parts of the Hale Memorial Church. It's an installation that can be done with other types of dirts, but this one is important. It was presented at the museum and the dirt is also from here and it's related to all uh, our lives. So uh, this dirt has, these little bags have inside of them a little bell. Each one of them has a bell. There's 480 bags and, um, and that bell that you can see there, if you didn't get close, you would miss the little bell. So it was important for people to get close. So that's something that is very important in, that I have discovered in time in my work. I use effort. And my, the way that my sensibility works is that it's through effort, the distribution of work, multiplying work, feel, feeling that work is connecting me, spending time with the object is connecting me to the object. We are spending a part of our lives together. So, Effort is something that connects us, that we're related to. So when a person see, if they were to see this work, it has happened very often that people would get close to it. And if you take the time to get close, then you would be able to discover this tiny little uh, drop of gold inside. So this installation is a three-part installation. This is the first one where you can see the little bags with a bell inside. Um, it's a transformation of a brick. So the first installation is dirt bags. All the dirt bags have a little bell inside and you can see the bell inside. The second installation will be, um, will be of rain. So I, I haven't done the whole installation yet. I did present a version of it this summer um, in, a res in, a, in an art space and uh, in the countryside of, of France in the 47 residency. Uh, it's in, it's in the countryside, it's pretty beautiful. And this is rain. So the second part of this installation would be to make an installation with rain. And the third part would be the bricks. So one bag of dirt, three bags of water would make a brick. And this brick, you would, never, you would not be able to see the, the bell again. So you would only have, excuse me, I should have been ready. <laughs> you would only have a, brick, a, a little brick of dirt at the end. And inside of it, there's a bell. So if you don't shake it, you don't know there's a bell. But to me, what is important in that process is that it elevates uh, the simplicity of the material because we know it contains a treasure inside. Mina in Spanish means uh, the mine, a place to find treasures. That's why I gave it that name. Um, in 2018, the young woman on that photograph is the curator of an incredible, Sophie Monjaret is her name. She made a, an incredible exhibition um, in the sacristy, in an old sacristy of a church that was never, that never finished, to, that, that was never finished, but the sacristy is still there and is used to make exhibitions, contemporary art exhibitions. So she presented 10 artists who would participate in an evolutive exhibition. So we were making the artwork as audience, people, visitors could come by, talk to us while we were making the work, asking us questions. So for a whole month, I was there. If I could have been there at night, I would, I would be able to say day and night, um, but they closed. So I, could, I, I was never able to, to stay. Did I? <laughs> I might have, no, I don't think so. I don't think they would allow me. But um, this material uh, was bought in Illinois most in Peoria and Morton, um, it's clothing patterns. I have been traveling a lot with my work. I am, a, I am a, the child of a very, a very traveling family. We have lived in different countries together and it is my education, it's part of me. If I don't travel, something is wrong. Not travel, but stay somewhere, go somewhere. Um, it is vital for me to be able to exchange, the, the, this sense of exchanging culture is something that is, um, I was made for, I was made like that. Uh, by my parents. So where I go, uh, if I travel somewhere, where my luggage is located is my home. And the luggage is where all my colors are. And to me, my clothing is like, if it was my home, it's the architecture of, it's it, in some ways, mm, architect, to me, those are maps of our architectures, of our colors. 
they have, uh, they're meant to build something that is really uh, defines for a lot of us, defines us, defines our moods, defines who we are. So these patterns, they're all, a lot of them have been used, not all have been used, but they have been given away uh, because they were found in secondhand stores. There is hundreds of them. And Sophie invited me to uh, create a work that was related to another artist. This artist's name is Alban de Nuit. Um, he is an artist who was one of our best friends who passed during the uh, attacks, the terror attacks in Paris. We lost him tragically and his work was, is sublime. His work was related to standards, standards that you can find in your everyday life, measurements that are inside of everything we do, you know, like the distance uh, of, of the rail tracks, the, just, little, just little, he would, he would find poetry in the standardization that was inside of our lives. So I wanted to offer him the opposite, not the measuring, but the unmeasurable. And this work that I did, often crying because his artwork was not far from me, was a conversation with one of his works in which I was giving him an unmeasurable feel. So each unit of, um, of um, patterns would be distributed on the floor. So you would never be able to create that clothing piece again. It would only be distributed by size on the floor. And then they would integrate this ensemble. And I would select the ones that would integrate this structure that would be growing little by little. And um, it was, it, it, I think that we arrived to 45 feet long to seven, uh, to 16 feet high. I, I always needed someone to help me um, pull it up. <laughs> so this is what it would look on the uh, complete opposite side to where we were a moment ago. And I, I put this photograph of two very important people in my life who are standing uh, there. Who, so you can see the size of it. Um, so this is unmeasurable because you can't measure each unit. Unmeasurable because its size seems to want to take over and has the potential to continue. And also because on the floor, there is more material. So you can continue, of course, since there is no more patterns, but I had so many more. <laughs> I was ready for more. <laughs> um, voila. This is uh, my first uh, real apartment. Earl and I lived inside of the church for three months when we, uh, we can say we squatted because we were trying, we were squatting because I did, we did try to pay for rent, but we never were able to find the previous owners. So uh, we pretty much used the space. Yeah, we were squatting the space, <laughs> not on purpose, but the church at the time was in no state to keep us inside. It was, it was in a very, very sad. Um, it was very hard. The, the breathing situation was intense. Yeah, it's beautiful, but for people to live inside at the time, since 10 years ago, it was very intense. So we, we moved on High Street, and this was our apartment. Very full with things, as you can see, but something that is very important is the ceiling. Um, I really didn't like our carpet. So it was, it was very uncomfortable. I had never seen that before. Just like, oh, there's carpet everywhere. And I needed that, that feeling to change. So I decided to put an artwork that I was in some way eager to make in the future. But at the time, I would just put it somewhere where I can see it, you know? So when you come into our home, the first thing you would see was the ceiling. So you didn't have to focus on the floor. Um, and it's made of tissue paper. Uh, something also I discovered here is the dollar store. And um, yes, I do go to very, uh, not very expensive spaces to find my materials because that's what I can afford. And um, I start to work with um, tissue paper. This is 2011 maybe, I don't remember, it was a long time ago. I wanted to make this piece and to make this piece I needed to make this paper stronger. So when you hold uh, a tissue paper and you make a paper ball, and you open it again, it, strength, it strengthens, hard to say, the paper, and you can build with it. So you need to, in some way, leave a trace, work with it, to, to, for it to work with you. So um, I had to work on each one of these papers to be able to saw them together, and I made this installation that wasn't ceiling. I had a very specific idea of what I wanted it to become in the future, which might happen, 
But for the years that we lived there, it was pretty fantastic to listen and discover what other people were, were feeling also when they would see it, look at it, talk to me about it. The goal wasn't for everyone to talk about it. It was mostly to focus on something that was more colorful than what we had under our feet. Under our feet. But that's how it began. So this work name is Dual. And then we moved to this bigger home at the time. So I, just, I asked Earl to cut it with me. We had lived under this art piece together. So let's cut it together. And we did this. And cutting them, in cutting them, um, I, I noticed how each one of them, you could locate each one of them because they had the trace of the others that surrounded it. So it, you can locate each one of these elements because they, they still have a little piece of the other. And in these cuttings, um, at the end, I also had a very small amount of little paper that, that was there, but had also lived with us for five years. So it was as important. So there's something that is, in, that, that is part of this project and was very inspiring was that I kept these and also the, the, the little paper, the little paper objects. Um, thinking that it would, it would take in the future when I would have the time because I would work on other projects at the same time. So when I would have the time to focus on this project, I'll do, and this is what I'm doing now. So dual is uh, what I would call, I've used several times the word encounters, and I'm going to do it again. An encounter between the symbolism of this paper, right? It's a very simple material. It's something that is, uh, that you can find every day at home. It's too delicate, right? Um, the symbolism, it's history, it's, it's almost as, as it's used in our society, but also it's so simple. Uh, it's also related to giving, right? Because it's related to giving an object to someone. So it has so many layers of signification. And I, I find it pretty beautiful that you need this in some way to make it even stronger. So I, I'm diving this project since uh, this year and um, at the beginning of this year, I had an art show in Peru, my first solo show in Peru. Um, and I presented this um, very large piece. It has 96 uh, units. And to me, it's the time you, when you get close to it, you can see that it's stitched with golden thread. And it's a way of calculating, uh, calculating time by colors. So it, these are a collection, a, a selection of, it's a palette of colors that, are, that I am sensible to, that I would create an ensemble with. And each one to me, it's an amount of time, the amount of time that I have spent connecting it with the others. And now I'm working on different formulations of this project. So the piece that you saw a moment ago is on the left. I took four units in different parts of it and I, I put them in glass, um, so sorry, acrylic boxes. So you were able to see the whole paper, the gesture, and you could see the stitching and the colors that were surrounding it. You could locate in time inside of the piece that was behind you, each element. And uh, in September, not too long ago, uh, I had the immense pleasure to participate in a pretty big gallery in France I say big because it's renowned, but also what's incredible, it's very tall, and I was very happy. Um, the only thing that is missing is one part. So the material of the second one, the first one that, I, that you see on the left, all the material comes uh, from the US. And the second one, it's material that comes from the market that, uh, that I have been going to since I'm a child. The name is Eden, the market Eden, Eden. Um, and in the market in Peru, what is beautiful about this paper is that each one has a different story. The first one is from the dollar store. The second one comes from a different type of store where the material has a different shape. The one in Peru is thinner and longer. And when you go to see a stand and you want to buy uh, tissue paper, every single person in, in this market in Peru would fold their paper in a way that it's more attractive to you. So they kind of have to make a presentation of their materials in a way for you to feel attracted and have the desire to buy from them. They spend hours, they receive rolls, but they spend hours folding each unit to put it in order so you can see all the colors they have accessible. So one person spends time doing that. So it's very important to know that each one of the materials of the, um, the origin of the materials of each, uh, of each artwork that I'm making in this series 
is of this project, not a series, a project, um, has also uh, a story. And in this one, I only took one unit. As you can see in the tiny little shelf, it was next to it. And it's in an in a acrylic box that it's three, three inches by three inches. Um, I, had, I was in Peru um, during the quarantine and um, during, it was a, Peru closed its doors at this time. The situation is uh, not doing very well for the coronavirus. But as soon as the, the quarantine happened all over the world, Peru closed absolutely everything. The doors, the airport, everything. And I couldn't leave. It wasn't like if I was trying to leave because I wanted to stay a little longer with my family. But we had a very small space to live together and I needed a space to be able to work. So I worked in the basement of the building. I created a studio, not the basement, sorry, the parking lot. So it was in the parking lot area that I created a studio space. And the day before I had to leave, I decided to make an installation for my parents um, to see. And my grandma too, but for her it's a photograph because she can't really go downstairs. And this is the artwork I made for them. It was only one night. I think it took me a long time to, it took me much more to make it than to share it with them. I don't even know if it was a few hours only because it's a parking lot and I need to move my, it's not that there is people coming in and out, but if they do, I have to be careful because the materials are very fragile. So there are two different formulations here. The first one on the left, I, I am exploring different forms of uh, the becoming of these pieces. But in the becoming of these pieces, each part can live separately from the others. So it's a project that I am embracing more and more the complexity of some of my works. And I didn't used to do that, but now I am. So I am working on projects that have different formulations, different formulas that can exist separately, but that also um, are part of a, a bigger ensemble. So this is uh, the one on the left, as you can see, it's, it's missing part or the part that is not on the, the fabric, the hanging fabric is on the floor organized, ready to go, ready to be a part of it, or the opposite, maybe taken off and, and reorganized in a different manner. And on the right, uh, there is something that I, I was, I wanted to distill that gesture more. It's like, how can I, how can I make this feel, you know, something that you can kind of like, so small, you can put in your pocket, the size of a stone, a tiny little stone. And I decided to take one of these units and um, extract the gesture and just keep the little, the little object, which is something, so th this is what we can call it my residency, my studio, my, my, my quarantine uh, studio, parking studio residency program, 65 days of work nonstop. And then last month, uh, we went to Canada where we stayed a month we also had to do um, a quarantine of two weeks. And um, I am very sad when I have to leave my studio. When I, when I know that I won't have a studio for a certain amount of time, I get very sad. So I brought with me a lot of material to be able to work. I often do that. Um, so in this trip, I explored this same uh, project again. And I had this, um, I made palettes of gestures, several of them actually, and I fell in love. <laughs> so I'm working on this project now. Um, it's, I mean, one of the projects I'm working on, but I'm focusing very much on this one, making palettes of gestures where you can, uh, the time that you spend, the, the, you, you're, you're putting a piece of, uh, you're sharing a part of you with the material. And then um, when you, when I connect, when I, put them in water and I make these palettes, they end up also having the, um, being, impre being touched by the colors surrounding them. So it's almost exactly the same as the beginning, but just told in a different, in a different form. So that's what I'm exploring at this time, um, exploring the significance, the forms um, of certain projects in multiple manners, exhaustive manners, um, till I get, Till, till we end up with maybe powder or just a very small amount of it's everything, right? What did it used to be? It used to be so many things, but at this time you're holding it in your hand. So we'll see. Transformation is part of uh, something that I care very much to um, work with. And this is 
sorry, this is the other palettes that I did. I'm also keeping uh, the color um, that is connecting. This is a, actually, it was a request from Heather uh, Placo who asked me if I could talk about the, the works I made in Canada. I wasn't planning on doing it, but it's a special request from the Riverfront Museum. <laughs> so I am sharing my, my secrets. This idea of secrets uh, and secrecy is something that is really important to me. I, I have been thinking about it lately because I like keeping things in secret or I don't share my studio. I, I am very private about um, the things that I make till the work comes out of my studio. The studio is a place that it's my insides, right? Please don't be careful. Like I, I am very care careful and cautious and because it's, it's where I am the most vulnerable. And to me, it, I realized that the idea of secrecy, I, I have to switch it to something that I would consider something to be more sacred or caring story, something that is full with something you can't hear. You can't read it, but you can feel it. So that's more in the, in the sense of secret that I, that I see. So I would like to share with you something that is uh, has happened multiple times in Peoria. Uh, I'm going to be very short here because uh, this project, so I'm going to talk a little bit of my, my performance work and my library solutions is the name of my library of gestures. Performance has been a practice that has been in parallel of my art making. Um, um, it hasn't been my, my main focus, but at focus, but at this time uh, I am diving more into it. So this library of gestures is a collection of objects, performances, films, photographs that are um, made during multiple performances that I make um, in any country that I go or many times in Peoria, inviting large amounts of people to share a moment together. The gestures, there is in this library, there is seven gestures, zero to six. And all of them have been extracted of my personal practice um, because it has happened many times during uh, my life that people would come to visit me in my studio or would see an artwork and would ask me a question that stayed very often in my mind. It's like, how do you do it? It's very difficult to explain to someone, uh, you can write it, but it isn't a feel. Like how, do you, how do I share with you this feel, this thing that takes over absolutely all my spirit and I can't, there is no words anymore. It, you just become, right? So how do I do it? Um, and that's how I was born. There's some also in my personal performances because I do, um, I do performances uh, that are intimate where my only audience is my husband and the magnificent filmmakers that work with me, Coralie Morin, the artist in France, or Skyler Edwards here in Peoria, um, that I trust my life with. Uh, they both do an exceptional job at uh, capturing uh, these moments. And I try in these performances to heal something that is incurable, like distance or time. In this one, I was trying to heal four years of life, like four years that happened that are heavy, certain things that are intense. So I calculated, kind of calculated about four years of life in, in my hair, and I created these little um, potions. So these potions or solutions, that's where the title comes from, are meant to cure something. So this idea of solution is uh, a moment that we shared together in which we're, we're healing distance. Distance from a stranger, because usually I separate friends from each other in the, in, in, the, in the participants, so they can kind of get close to other people by sharing the moment together. But I will tell you nothing about the gestures, because I would like you to be able one day to participate. It's open for everyone, anyone, all ages. You know, it's, a, it's a, an experience that the less you know about these gestures, it is, um, it is better for, it, it's, it's for you to be able to give uh, the, most unique, your, the most unique form of your understanding. Every person, that every, every performance, I uh, give an, the same instruction to everyone. And during the process, you can see that every person understands the same thing in a completely different manner or a slightly different, but 
So it's a celebration of uniqueness. So this whole project is a celebration of uniqueness. The filmmaker will film differently than the other one. So every single layer of this project is important. Every part of it, it will, there will be books, there will be films, there will be objects, and I'm working on making this project grow, hopefully for it to be integrated in, a, in an institution so it can become a more regular uh, project. But yes, so I will show you photographs of the most representative um, sessions that we have lived here in Peoria. And the last one is in Paris. <laughs> here, uh, just so you can know, solutions, this is uh, the way that I formulate the titles. Every session is, the first one is, these are the titles of each performance. So the S is for solution, which is the name of the project. The, it's followed by the number of the gesture, then a dot. And then the smaller S for session, the number of the session um, after that. So this is session number, uh, so sorry, gesture zero, session number four. That we did, it was on, on Main Street, on a kind of a hidden area of Main Street with 21 performers. It was, uh, it was this was a very special performance because um, I did the same performance with the help of my dear friend, uh, Muriel Babandisha. Muriel was making, was organizing the same performance uh, for me in Paris in an art center. So we did a simultaneous performance between Paris and Peoria and everyone was united by the same gestures. And this performance was projected there at the same time. So you were able to see people that were located in completely different spaces and people in front of you doing the same thing and kind of connecting with each other. It was memorable. And these are the remaining objects. Again, I will not extend myself on it. This is one of the performances I made at the Prairie Center of the Arts, a photograph again by Skyler Edwards. A lot of my friends are there, but I did say there's 42 people in this performance and I did another one a few months later, and again, we had 42 people. So when you participate in one gesture, you can't participate in the same one again. And this is gesture number two. And this is uh, the remaining object when it integrates the library. This is gesture number three. This was very important. It was in High Place, uh, our space, where we will be making exhibitions in the future. I, uh, this performance happened on my birthday. I invited 27 women that are really important to me. And I can tell also to Peoria. They are um, very important people to me in Peoria. I have to say it twice. <laughs> and this was the remaining uh, gestures. Again, it's Skyler Edwards. As you can see, I work very often with him because I trust and admire his work. And this was the one in Paris. Uh, it was the la not, not the last performance I did, but one of the last. Um, this is at the Collège de Bernardin, the same place where I made the large exhibition, the uh, large uh, installation, Desmedida. Uh, Des uh, I made this performance, it's gesture five. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's tissue paper. So this performance comes from the, the project Dual. It's a gesture that comes from this, uh, from this project. And uh, something that is very important about these um, experiences is that when we have the honor to witness these performances, we can see every single person working. We can feel the sound of their gestures because these performances are silent. The sound takes over the room and envelops everyone. So they are the, the, the whole, the, everything you see is the artwork. Everything you, you hear is the artwork they are the artwork on their understanding and the way they're making but the audience because you accompany you know you're accompanying them too uh, i feel as if you're also part of 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 the art of, of this art making process and there is a, a form of reverence between both you know they command silence so the audience is silent they're focused so the audience too and everybody works together. I really uh, hope that you can send me a message and find me online and give me your email so we can, I can, we can contact you so you can participate in the future when I will make other performances. Again, open to everyone. <laughs> and this is uh, the remaining gesture at the end of that performance. 
this is um, one of the walls of my solo show in Peru. Um, I was presenting the performances I had made related to the very large fabric that was coming from the ceiling. So this is, um, I think, the most important part of the presentation. <laughs> um, this is a list of the persons who have been working with me, um, sharing their efforts with me. They have given so much to me, and I am so thankful because none of the things that I have accomplished in Peoria would have happened without them. As an art, not as an as a as an art as a director of an organization. This is about my art making. These are the people who have um, given so much to me and have made uh, colossal moments happen in Peoria with me. And I want to dedicate this presentation to them. Voila, I'm done. <laughs> Do you have uh, any questions for me about anything uh, that you want? If it's related to the building specifically, I think that. Er and I would like to pr prepare in the future a presentation and we'll let, of course, our department know, find a moment to talk about specifically the church, um, because I know those questions come always first. Um, but I would be glad to answer any questions about Yaku Arts, uh, our art magazine, and my art making process, if you have any for me. Yep, if you feel comfortable, you may go ahead and unmute yourself to ask a question with your own voice, otherwise, uh, don't hesitate to drop a question in the chat so I can answer, uh, ask it for you. So does anyone have any question? If we have... Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to ask, I love what you did in your first apartment. I had never seen that before with on the ceiling. That was amazing. And I wanted to ask, what did you do with the tissue paper you said to make it so that you could sew with it? To be able to, if you want to work with tissue paper, it is very delicate. So it is um, when you have the paper, you have to crumble and then open it again. When you open it again, it breaks the fibers inside of the paper. So it makes the paper much stronger. So you're able to sew it together. So when people would spend a while sitting in our ceiling or we were going to look for water for them or anything, they would be sitting and they would be looking and be like, that's stitched by hand because on the ceiling, the stitch were, in, were black. So it was easier. I didn't do it on purpose because that's at the time I wasn't necessarily thinking about the specific color. Now I only use uh, gold but I have been only using gold, that might change. But um, when you would spend a moment and take the time to look at it, you'd be like, oh, that's not a fabric. Because it seemed just like fabric. Like I put a fabric on the ceiling, like a lot of young people do in Peoria when they move you know, to their dorms or you know, I've seen it in Peoria. It was a very typical thing that I have seen in many actually dorm apartments or rooms of friends of Earl from Bradley who would have fabrics on the walls and the ceiling. I'm like, oh, interesting. Oh, we couldn't do the same, but it was a completely different type of experience. And I think that I, I also um, stitched in one area, and uh, maybe something that said made with its paper. Yeah, I wrote its paper, you know, a little note that said, I would have to find it. I don't remember. I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you for asking. If you have other questions. <laughs> I have a question. Hi. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, you were talking about how um, during your creative process, and not only your creative process, but like the entire uh, masterpiece, how you allow uh, it to transform. So I was wondering if um, also like the story behind the material helps you transform the the view you have of the masterpiece thank you so much it's a beautiful question yes um it is because i am in some way invaded by the beauty the strength or the curiosity that i have of the material that i and the size or type of project that i think of them allows me to spend a lot of time with them understanding them making research about them trying to see 
uh, what is the what is its implication in the place where I found it? What is its implication in the place where I'm going to present it? How is this material? How can the material, in some way, uh, its history can be respected? You know, and not uh, I have to create balance. You know, to not modify too much, to transform it in a way that it modify uh, it modifies its simplicity and its own story. So yes, mm -hmm. it's completely a part of it. I have yeah, it's a very animist. I don't know if the words animistic or anime an animistic <laughs> yeah i understand yeah it's a very um i am really taken over by the the power that i feel have certain objects have over me it can sound a little intense and mm -hmm, but i totally embrace it <laughs> great and i have another question before someone else jumps in sorry <laughs> and the other one was um so throughout your whole history as an as an artist um do you like did you know that somehow all your pieces were going to talk between them does it make sense wow <laughs> or it's maybe something yeah, like you can cry <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's something that you're trying to say in some kind of like um uh unconscious way totally there is something that um, there is uh, this idea beautiful that you bring this up because when I was trying to discover um, how how is everything that I, that I have inside is going to be translated how is everything going to be a part of in doing my of, of a total right like a result in some way like a calculation or formulations um, and doing my studies my teacher um, accepted me to be a part of his studio because he said, I like the identity of your work. You can take a table and install yourself there. So I learned through staying very close to him that, and the way that he would communicate with any, everyone that he was always looking to uh, um, help us find the line in the middle. What was, you know, what was that line right in the middle of all of it? They can all take different forms and shapes but there is this thing right in the middle of all, and it's you. So how, to me, it's, I, I, sometimes there are certain artworks that I have done in the past that I haven't shown today that were not my favorites, but they were still carrying a line of my person, of my time, of my experiences, and my curiosity of the objects. So I was like, oh, they're still related. But the beautiful, the reason why I'm so excited that you brought this up is because when I was just, before entering my school, or start, starting to try to get into my school, in my preparatory school, I wrote uh, something that I wanted to do was, when I would be done with a consequent amount of work, I hope I use well that word, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to create some type of IU, a gathering of all my art friends who could bring all their artworks together at the same time as me. It's like, how do we bring everything that we have done together and we can see through who you are. Can we see you through? Are you in all of it? So it's a beautiful question that you're asking because I feel that everything that I, that I have done up until now has started with that question of how is this going to end? How am I going to put them all together in the end? And I am working on that at this time because I would like to find a way to distill as much as I can from each one of them and have a collection of endings, you know? Like Devota, I didn't show it to I wanted to, but at Devota, I'm making bricks with everything, with all the paper bags, with groups of, groupments of paper bags, I'm making bricks. Esteta, the same, I'm making, so one of them are gold, others, others are, are pink, uh, and do all the same. See, it's a large artwork, and then in the end, it ends up being bricks. So little by little, I'm gonna have like a little, let's say a little wall or a structure made of all. Thank you for your Thank you. question. <laughs> <laughs> that was an excellent question. Does anyone have any other ones? Uh, I see a lot of comments uh, about the presentation and I'm so glad uh, everyone liked it. And uh, Natalia, I am saving these comments so you can read them later. So if you don't have time to check them out right now, I am saving them for you. Um, 
I do have a question for you myself. Um, when you start your process, I know it's a combination, but what usually comes first, the object or the idea? Um, I'm trying, I'm like, this one, this one, that one. I'm going through all of them. Um, I'm going to add a third one because there is also the feeling, the moon. It's funny because the internet has, has been teaching me about this, you know, the photograph yes. of the moon. And I see this photograph, it's like, wow, that's beautiful. Well done. You know, when they give you these options of nine faces, which one is yours today? And we switch and we change. So mood would be a third one. Uh, and I have one that changes a lot. <laughs> mood and history. Um, I, it, it really, let me think just a second. Cause I don't, I, it's not that I don't remember. It's just that um, I don't know which one is more, takes over most, you know? Um, it has happened to me many times to find objects, know that they're there. Believe me, I have a large collection. I am organizing them since five days right now. <laughs> of treasures, things that I treasure and that I know, they will find a moment in my life to be translated, responding to the, you know, what surrounds me, the space that surrounds me. It can be a place, it can be a situation. So I think that it, it really depends on what, it depends, sometimes I can have, I'm trying to think if sometimes I have an I no, it can, it can depend. Sometimes I gather certain, I have a long, huge gathering of treasures that are waiting to be transmitted and I also have a certain specific projects that I haven't found you know the object that has uh, the, the can create the potential to make it happen you know so I have a bit it's a little of both yeah it looks like it and I I wish I could see your, your stash of treasures because I'd love to see what kind of other things you'll be able to transform. But if no one else has any other questions, I'm going to no, go no, ahead no, and- no. Um, Let me tell you something important, just a second for what you just said right now. Mm -hmm. I was work, I had a full-time job uh, here in Peoria uh, not too long ago. And I was gonna tell that job that I was gonna go to Peru, to work, to for a show. So I didn't know if they were gonna keep me because I was gonna go to Peru for a long time for shows. I was, I'm gonna take the risk, we'll see, right? And Earl was waiting for me in the car and it took a long time and we we're gonna be late, both of us. And he said, so what, where are you? He's not, he's never heard, heard of me like that, but where are you? And I was like, I'm on my way. So I go in the car, I see, and he goes, where were you? And I was like, I was at the door of my studio counting how many projects, most of them large installations, I, um, I haven't worked with, or I haven't touched in the past five years. He says, we counted them all. Yeah. How many? 31. <laughs> he says, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. So that's why I started this uh, rep repertory, repertory, repertory. Re repertory. Ah, I was looking yeah. for the video. I, I, I found the, I, I'm, I'm working on a repertory of, um, of sketches. I'm not, a, I, I'm not a drawer, I'm not a painter, but sketches made with pen, painting <laughs> of artworks that I have done that I want to make and that I will never make because I know that I don't have a lifetime to accomplish at least 31% of them. <laughs> I mean, I know that I can't accomplish them all. So I am creating this repertoire now. So yeah, so yeah, you would want to see the, the, the treasures, but you might not need to hear all the stories because it's a lot. <laughs> Voilà. Well, I know we all had a wonderful time. I'm just going to do very quickly um, just thank everyone for attending Art Club today and a humongous thank you to Natalia for presenting her amazing work. And uh, be sure to tune in next month, uh, Tuesday, December 8th at 1 p.m. Uh, we'll be hosting Dana Baldwin for a pres special presentation of her work. And also a thanks to go out to uh, all of our museum members and Visionary Society members for their continued support of our virtual programming. And thanks again. And uh, I hope everyone else has a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>